My name is Kristen Ondeko Ligda, and I will be talking to you about special techniques involved in anesthesia. Controlled hypotension is one of the techniques involved in anesthesia. With controlled hypotension, the goal is to decrease bleeding and need for transfusion, to improve the operative field and decrease operating time, to reduce systolic blood pressure to 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury, and mean arterial pressure to 50 to 65 millimeters of mercury. There's a 30% reduction of the overall mean arterial pressure from baseline. However, throughout controlled hypotension, the goal is still to maintain organ perfusion. Controlled hypotension in the cardiovascular system may involve the coronary blood flow. Of concern, the goal is to ensure adequate aortic diastolic pressure, as this is what affects coronary perfusion, and also to ensure oxygen extraction within the coronary blood flow system. Decreased cardiac output may involve decreased contractility and heart rate, or decreased blood volume, and peripheral vascular resistance. By blocking the alpha adrenergic receptors, this allows the relaxation of vascular smooth muscle to dilate the vasculature. With controlled hypotension in the neurologic system, the focus is on cerebral autoregulation, which has been talked about in a previous presentation. This involves the autoregulation of the PaCO2, the PaO2, and the mean arterial blood pressure. There's, with the renal system, there's autoregulation between 80 to 180 millimeters of mercury. The respiratory system involves vasodilators that inhibit hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. This increases blood flow to dependent areas. And the PaCO2 and the end-tidal CO2 gradient increases. Surgical indications for controlled hypotension include oromaxillofacial surgery, endoscopic sinus or middle ear microsurgery, spine aneurysm and other neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, prostatectomy, cardiac surgery, and liver transplant surgery. Considerations for controlled hypotension may also play a role with the patient risk factors. One must consider the risk benefits of controlled hypotension in patients with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, anemia, cerebrovascular disease, hepatic disease, renal disease, or severe systemic hypertension. Controlled hypotension also involves positioning, which may involve cerebral monitoring. The beach chair position plays an interesting role in that typically blood pressures are monitored in the peripheral zone, but not necessarily measuring the blood pressure at the, per at the perfusion of the brain. Controlled hypotension may also be achieved through ventilation with positive airway pressures and neuroaxial anesthesia due to the relaxation of the vasculature due to, due to the blunting of the sympathetic re responses. Pharmacologic methods are utilized for also controlling hypotension. Pharmacologic methods in are easy to administer. They typically have, the goal would be to use drugs that have rapid onset and offset to have rapid elimination without metabolite accumulation, negligible effects on vital organs, and predictable and dose-dependent effects. Agents used alone for controlled hypotension include inhalation anesthetics, sodium nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, trimethophan camsulate, alprostadil, adenosine, remifentanil, and local anesthetics for spinal analgesia, spinal anesthetics. Agents used alone or in combination include calcium channel antagonists, such as nicardipine, beta adrenoreceptor antagonists, such as esmolol, phenoldopam, ACE inhibitors, or clonidine. Hypothermia is when core temperature is less than 35 degrees Celsius. Metabolic effects of hypothermia include shivering, Shivering increases oxygen consumption, both myocardial oxygen consumption and oxygen, oxygen consumption within the musculature. Adrenergic effects of hypothermia include sympathetic stimulation, such as release of norepinephrine. Coagulation is also affected by hypothermia in that there's impaired platelet function and coagulation, which may lead to an increased blood loss. Cardiovascular effects of hypothermia include systemic and pulmonary vasoconstriction. This may increase blood pressure and arrhythmias. Immunologic effects of hypothermia 
include decreased neutrophil function, decreased tissue oxygenation, increased risk for wound infection. Pharmacologic effects of hypothermia include potentiation of neuromuscular blocking drugs. For patients for which controlled hypotension, hypothermia are necessary, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with return of spontaneous circulation are one of the patients for whom controlled hypothermia is indicated. The patients are, are cooled to 32 to 34 degrees Celsius for 12 to 24 hours. Inclusion criteria for controlled hypothermia for the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest include if it's initiated within six hours after arrest, and systolic blood pressures are maintained greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, and the patient's in a comatose state. Exclusion criteria for controlled hypothermia for patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest include recent major surgery, systemic infection or sepsis, pre-existing coma, and active bleeding. Cooling methods that are utilized for initiation of controlled hypothermia include surface cooling, such as application of ice packs, cooling blankets, heat exchange devices or cooling helmets, or internal cooling, such as catheter-based technologies or the infusion of cold fluids. The goal with controlled hypothermia would be to maintain the mean arterial pressure greater than 80 millimeters of mercury, to use neuroprotective effects of the head of bed greater than 30 degrees, to assess for thermal injury, and to monitor for EKG changes. The heart rate may be less than 40 in patients who are undergoing controlled hypothermia. With controlled rewarming, this may begin 24 hours after the initiation of cooling. Typically, the patients are rewarmed at 0.3 to 0.5 degrees Celsius per hour over approximately eight hours. The goal would be to maintain sedation and paralysis until the patient reaches 35 degrees, continuing to monitor the entire time for hypotension, which may be occurring due to the vasodilation from rewarming. Controlled hypothermia may also be used for neurosurgery if there's a risk for cerebral ischemia. Cerebral hypoxia and neuronal cell death leading to mortality and neurologic disability may be indicative of the need for controlled hypothermia. Hyperbaric oxygenation is oxygen delivery with barometric pressures greater than one atmosphere. This may be utilized for patients with arterial air embolism, decompression sickness, severe anemia or hypoperfusion, carbon monoxide poisoning, or gas gangrene. Hyperbaric oxygenation involves increased undissolved oxygen within the blood. Within the blood. This may lead to reduced perfusion needs. There's little respiratory effect from hyperbaric oxygenation. Alveolar oxygen tension increased to 420 millimeters of mercury at three atmospheres, and hyper, hyperventilation may occur. Cerebral irritability may be appreciated at greater than three atmospheres during hyperbaric oxygenation, and symptoms of cerebral irritability may, res may resemble hypoxia or ischemia. Hyperbaric oxygenation may decrease MAC due to the increase in partial pressures of volatile anesthetics and the increase in gas density. Flow meters may read falsely high. There may be a 20% change at 3,000 meters. 2% sevoflurane at one atmosphere may be the equivalent to 0.66% sevoflurane at three atmospheres. An oxygen analyzer may be essential in patients who are undergoing hyperbaric oxygenation. High altitude anesthesia is one of the other special techniques involved in anesthesia care. In high altitude anesthesia, the respiratory system may be most affected. The oxygen gradient still maintains a 20.93% or 21% up to 33,000 feet. However, oxygen compressibility is involved with changes in the barometric pressure. At sea level, the barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere. The partial pressure of oxygen at sea level, given the 21% oxygen gradient, is 159 millimeters of mercury. 
the water vapor tension is 47 millimeters of mercury. Altitude decreases barometric pressure. There's a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen. With the oxygen cascade, there's diffusion down to the mitochondria. The final partial pressure of oxygen in mixed venous blood is not diminished. However, keep in mind there's also an oxidative reaction that must occur with at least one to two millimeters of mercury of oxygen. Anything less than one to two millimeters of mercury sends the cells into anaerobic metabolism. This is also called the Pasteur point. Adjustment is needed if, in order to ensure tissue metabolism and oxygen transport in the body. With high altitude anesthesia, there's a decreased PaO2. This may lead to hyperventilation, which increases the alveolar oxygen partial pressure. The chemoreceptor cells may be triggered, triggered in the carotid body or the aortic body. The cardiovascular system may respond with high altitude, with exposure to continuous high altitude by increasing red blood cells and blood volume in a chronic, in a chronic exposure. High altitude pulmonary edema may occur, which is increased pulmonary arterial pressure and increased vascular permeability. With high altitude anesthesia, there is a risk of perioperative hypoxia. The goal would be to correct any anemias for the patient and follow an acclimatization schedule to be able to ensure that the patient has had adequate time to adjust to a high altitude. Volume resuscitation may be necessary, and their patient may also have increased bleeding due to venous pressure, blood volume, venous dilation, and capillary density. High oxygen concentration administration may also be needed. Anesthesia inhibits hyperventilation, and so a lower arterial P Partial pressure, partial pressure of oxygen may lead to hypoxic brain injury. There's also decreased buffering capacity of the body whenever the patient is exposed to high oxygen concentration at high altitudes. <laughs>